All right, now we're going to join John Clark with Clark Energy Consulting. Of course, there was a OPEC meeting today, and I'll tell you, I got to be honest here. I've, I've been so busy with things. Our phone and our emails have been so busy because people are trying to separate themselves from the noise out there. There's just so much information, and there's no sports going on, so people are just inundated with news and trying to consume so much. I didn't even really even know there was a meeting going on. I think I knew about it, but I wasn't sure, and so I just thought I'd bring in John Clark and John Clark with Clark Energy Consulting. How are you doing today? Hey, Jason. Doing well. How are you? Oh, not too bad. I just, like I said, man, I'm so busy trying to keep up with everything because in my world, I don't know about your world, uh, everybody is trying to separate themselves from the noise out there because everybody and their brother and their sister literally are on social media because they got nowhere else to go and nothing else to do type of a thing. And there's some people that are getting together and apparently having emergency meetings and all these other things. So uh, how can somebody, you know, stand out a little bit? Well, get a hold of John Clark and figure out what's going on with OPEC. So let's talk a little bit about the pricing and how people can utilize today's information. Sure, Jason. Yeah, thanks for the intro. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting. And now more than ever, uh, especially while people are sitting, staying at home due to the outbreak, uh, there's so much news and so much information that comes out. Uh, it's sometimes it's hard to know, you know, what's true, what's rumored. And, and uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about what happened with the OPEC meeting. Uh, so the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries met today in an emergency virtual meeting and agreed to an outline of an unprecedented uh, production cut of 23% or 11 million barrels per day. That would be the largest cut in history. Uh, but many analysts are suggesting that it could fall through if other nations don't agree to cuts as well. You may have heard the term OPEC plus. That would be the original OPEC members plus Russia and the new term that's been coined OPEC plus plus, which would be the, that same OPEC plus group. In addition, the uh, other nations like the U.S., um, and so really, we need some more clarity on this outline of an agreement that came out today. What happened with oil prices? Uh, the the, the re report came out at uh, 10 a.m. Central. Oil prices jumped on the news. And what often happens, as I do follow the oil futures market, uh, there's something called buy the rumor, sell the news. And so uh, what happened is oil jumped on the news and sold off. Uh, I think it jumped a uh, double digit percentage and then sold off like 9% after the report came out stating that it was uh, just an outline to an agreement. And so the current situation, so tomorrow, uh, Friday is the G20 Energy Summit and many analysts expect to uh, get more clarity on whether or not US will participate in this global oil production cut. How about when it comes to Saudi Arabia, Russia? Obviously, a lot of people had pointed some fingers at them for, well, they even used the word shenanigans. So uh, was it, what, did you see anything on that in terms of was that brought up? Was that addressed? Is it just kind of we're not going to really talk about it? We're going to fix the problem first. Did you see anything when it comes to Russia or Saudi Arabia? When... When Trump uh, tweeted, I think it was last week, that he was hopeful that Saudi and Russia would come to an agreement of uh, 10 to 15 million barrels reduction per day, uh, it turns out that uh, <laughs> he didn't even speak to both parties. So there's been, uh, you know, a lot of rumors, rumors and, and speculation. Uh, I, I certainly don't know what's going on, you know, within the kingdom and with, you know, within the Kremlin, but... Uh, I do know that, um, you know, what I've seen in the past, and this hap seems to happen during election years, I, I followed the markets last election year in 2016, and, you know, it's really just the last five years in, in the oil extended downturn, uh, <laughs> I typically say not to trust anything OPEC says. There's oftentimes, uh, you know, job owning that occurs where, they say, oh, you know, we're, we're expecting to cut or we, we hope to cut. And, you know, this comes out of the news and people get all excited. But then when the actual, you know, cuts do come out, even in the past when Saudi and 
uh, OPEC has have announced production cuts, uh, oil prices dropped, and so it's almost illogical uh, when you when you follow the markets and follow the news flow. Um, you know what I've heard is that Saudi Arabia needs about an 80, 80 to eighty five dollar per barrel to uh, to fix their overall uh, balance sheet, but they're their break-even production cost is like nine dollars a barrel so they you know they're still making positive cash flow even in that twenty dollar oil i'm not sure what russia's you know break-even point is but obviously we know the u.s shale is you know losing money below you know forty forty dollars for sure and so in this price environment you know we've already seen um 120 or 120 rigs dropped uh, or 15 percent in the past two weeks and some analysts expect that number to fall another 100 rigs in the next month and so uh, you know typically you know we've seen this in the past when oil prices are low operators cut rigs and allow for their wells to naturally decline and that kind of manages itself uh, but in today's unprecedented supply glut, there have been additional measures necessary uh, that have been talked about, such as curtailing production or even shutting in producing wells. There have, you know, th- the question is, can the independent producers of America co- coordinate to shut in production, you know, as the international oil companies can do? Well, the problem is there's about 9,000 I don't know if you knew this, Jason, there's about 9,000 independent U.S. producers. And in a capital-free market, additionally, with lease obligations, uh, debt repayment obligations, it's impossible for this to happen. There's not, it's not possible unless there are federal regulations or even state regulations that uh, prorate production or curtail production. And what I've been hearing is that many of the producers don't want to do that. Part of it is because they have to they have their covenants of their debt they have to pay back and they still have to you know make cash flow or they must drill in order to secure leaseholds so they can drill in the future and so i think as far as rig count goes we'll start to see that decline and that will impact production but it it may come to the point of operators may have to actually shut in their wells because they may recognize hey we can't make money at this price let's you know wait and you know, open the wells back up whenever prices look better. Uh, so it's, it's 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 certainly an interesting dynamic. You know, the other dynamic, and we saw this in the last supply gut, glut, excuse me, um, that we're actually running out of capacity, storage capacity. And, you know, Cushing is the pricing point for WTI in Oklahoma. And that's where, you know, the product is priced and sold at. And if you've ever been out there, it's interesting. I have a cousin that lives in Cushing, Oklahoma. It's the uh, pipeline crossroads of America. And they have these huge, huge tank farms. I don't know how much each tank holds, but it's got to be thousands of barrels or, or more, uh, hundreds of thousands possibly, that hold all this crude. And, and we're I think we're close to you know 90% full. And some analysts expect that uh, our storage capacity will be full in the next four to six weeks. And so there actually have been several midstream companies that have even sent letters to producers asking them to curtail their production, which is unprecedented because that goes directly against the pipeline company's interests. You know, they get, they're basically like a toll road. So they get paid, you know, as the oil flows through their pipes and the more volume that goes through it, the more the money they make. Um, so if they're asking producers to reduce their production, that certainly means they have limited capacity and or the pipeline companies, you know, they're they're the middle party between, you know, the producer and consumer. And so they that tells me they expect oil prices to be even lower in the, in the coming weeks uh, than it is today because their, you know, their incentive would be, uh, why would we take on this oil now and pay a higher price when it, we think it may drop further and then we're, our storage capacity has been reached at a sooner point in time and then they may actually have a, a differential where they actually have to pay to sell their oil to someone else. So it's a, it's a lose-lose situation whenever we're reaching this 
storage capacity limit. Um, and that really goes to tell me that I don't think that even the proposed agreement of 11 million barrels per day cut will balance the oil markets. And many estimate that due to the coronavirus, 20 to 30 million barrels per day of demand has been taken offline. So 11 million barrels per day is, is not going to cut it. Uh, thank you, but not enough OPEC. And even if they do cut, we're still faced with a supply glut. I've heard some companies are looking at uh, storage in terms of figuring out ways to you know turn their there's their storage units uh in, into oil storage during this because the refineries are full and i don't know the science behind it but i know that there are people doing blueprints and drawings right now because of the issue that you're talking about be the refineries are full storage is about ready to be completely at capacity so there are some people who are looking at hey I'm, i'll become a storage facility for oil for a while if that's what it takes you bet i mean because they're there is going to be a little bit of a of a trickle coming still, you know. It's just it's it's not like turning the spigot off. And when when you're full, you're full. So we'll have to keep an eye on this story because there's definitely more to it, and it's not over yet. But I do want to ask you about tariffs coming out of this OPEC Plus meeting. Uh, it's, it seems like there's more questions and answers so far, John. And you're not the only one. I got an email from Senator Kramer while we were talking, and he said the same thing, very similar. Let me, I'll read you his comments here. These reports are encouraging and a step in the right direction. No matter what, the mess Saudi Arabia and Russia made will, may take years to clean up. I look forward to reviewing more details as they come out and seeing if these actions are enough to provide market stability. And we'll be watching closely to ensure a follow through by, a follow -through by parties. If not, the United States will further empowered to take immediate action. Very similar to what you're saying in terms of there's... There's, we're going to have to take a look at this report a little bit more. Plus, we're going to have to see if it's going to continue on. Uh, I did want to ask you about tariffs. I know tariffs was something I saw on the news the last couple. In fact, I think probably the last week or two. I haven't explored it yet because I didn't think we were that serious about it. And so I, I didn't know if it was actually serious enough to be discussed into this OPEC meeting or not. But I, I know it's been in the news and I know it's been talked about, but I didn't know if it reached the level of severity to where we'd actually do it or not. Uh, did you see anything about tariffs? Yeah, I've, I've been following that too. I, I'm not certain on what the you know economic impact of tariffs would be as far as the current environment, but I, I do know that uh, Harold Hamm, uh, Continental Resources CEO, um, uh, and a and a you know oil uh, giant in in the Bakken there in North Dakota, Jason. He he mentioned that he doesn't think that tariffs are are a solution. Uh, and you know really what's happening is Saudi and, and Russia are economic dumping. I think there may be some uh, uh, recourse that the government can take uh, as far as an anti-dumping um, tariff or something like that. I, I'm not certain what what that'll do to the markets. Um, I think in general. You know, you know the the U.S. shale and, and American oil and gas has really been founded on capital free markets, and uh, there's some people that really want you know I, that really think that the best solution, uh, and you may have heard this term, you know, the cure for low prices is low prices. Uh, really, what that means is you know, uh, if the government steps in to provide to apply tariffs, uh, you know, there still could be. Uh, unseen consequences or unforeseen consequences uh, and hidden costs or different trade-offs. Um, and, and that's that's really a, a macroeconomic question. Um, not not s certain on how that would, you know, really help. I think, um, you know, it, it, there's still the supply glut and there's still the, the, uh, the fact that producers still have to pay their debts. And, uh, and so it, I think many producers don't don't want to be forced to curtail many, you know, capitalists say, you know, it's a free market, we should let it solve itself. And, you know, at the end of this will be a more efficient industry, and ultimately, you know, be able to, um, you know, pr provide energy when prices are higher, and as people go back to work and drive their cars and start flying again. Um, so it'll be certainly something to watch for over the, you know, coming weeks and months. 
Yeah, I was a little bit taken back by the tariffs. You know, I like I said, I get it. I understand it. I, I totally am on board with any time a discussion is is open. But at the end of the day, I always go back to what does the free market say? What what does the free market want to do on this? We're moving in the right direction if we could just get there, you know, if we can get the pipelines built and some other things. So uh, I guess I'm just trying to conclude here with we're moving in the right direction. And it sounds like this OPEC meeting was at least knocking us back on the right track again after what essentially just, you know, created a shock to the system. You know, we, we had a we had a shock when it came to OPEC with Russia and, and Saudi Arabia. And then we had a shock when it came to the coronavirus. So it just seems like um, this is at least good news, John. Yeah, I mean, the way I see it, you know, as a free market capitalist that, you know, the efficiencies and, you know, the the strong will survive. And those are the companies that need to, you know, with the good balance sheets and, and good management. Uh, out of the 9,000 companies, you know, U.S. Shale has independent, there there's a handful, plenty of them that, you know, have been, you know, ran poorly, uh, you know, also not been accretive to share, shareholders. And investors are, are demanding, uh, you know, to be more accretive and, and consider free cash flows. And so, this is a problem that our industry has faced over the last five years, you know, even the last decade, even when oil was a hundred dollars a barrel, you know, your, your sins are forgiven at a hundred dollars a barrel, but when you have low prices, it really forces economic, uh, you know, considerations and, and really looking at every dollar spent. And so, uh, you know, I think it's a good thing for the industry. It's going to, it's going to be tough for, you know, the foreseeable future, but at, at the end of this, we're going to come out stronger and ultimately American oil and gas will uh, still, you know, maintain energy dominance. It's it, it just a, it's just going to be a, uh, a short time to rest and, and reevaluate and, um, you know, ultimately, you know, focus on what we can do. And, and even if even if that means not drilling, completing uh, or even curtailing production wells, there's still opportunities to take information and learn. And I think our industry and I've found myself in this. Uh, experience as well having worked for four different producers sometimes when when it's when the goal is growth at all cost you you don't always have time to look back and see what were the results of the decisions that were being made and so now we have time for pause and the industry can really look at you know how can we do better and continue to evolve and transform and and leverage technology efficiencies learnings that has been really the crux of the shale revolution and so we're we're continuing to evolve. That's just part of the, the capital free market process.